Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BRP Inc.'s Fiscal Year 2024 Third Quarter Results Conference Call. For participants who use the telephone line, it is recommended to turn off the sound on your device. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Philippe Deschines. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sylvie. Good morning and welcome to BRP's conference call for the third quarter of fiscal year 24. Joining me this morning are José Boisjoli, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Sébastien Martel, Chief <coughs> Financial Officer. Before we move to the prepared remarks, I would like to remind everyone that certain forward-looking statements will be made during the call and that the actual result could differ from those implied in these statements. The forward-looking information is based on certain assumptions and is subject to risk and uncertainties, and I invite you to consult BRP's MDNA for a complete list of these. Also during the call, reference will be made to supporting slides, and you can find the presentation on our website at brp.com under the Investor Relations section. So with that, I'll turn the call over to Jose. Thank you, Philip. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. BRP delivered a sound performance in the third quarter as our team continued to demonstrate its commitment and resilience in a dynamic environment. We maintain our momentum in gaining market share in the off-road category and delivered financial results that came in close to our expectation. However, like the rest of the industry and despite our continued solid execution, we are seeing signs of softening demand in certain product categories, more particularly in international markets. The situation leads us to proactively take a more cautious approach for the upcoming quarters as we strive to maintain a solid value proposition for our dealers. We remain committed to continue to lead our industry and to further grow our market share. We believe that our proactive action will further solidify BRP position for long-term success. Let's turn to slide four for key financial highlight of the quarter. Revenue reached $2.5 billion below our expectation due to softer demand in international markets and to a lesser extent, a temporary slowdown at the Texas-Mexico borders, which impacted deliveries of side-by-side and ETV over three weeks near to the end of the quarter. This situation is now back to normal. With a strong product mix and tight expense management, we've still delivered normalized EBITDA of $445 million and normalized diluted EPS of $3.06, both coming in close to our expectation. Turning to slide five for a look at our retail performance. In North America, our retail sales were about flat with continued solid growth in ORV and snowmobile, offset by decline in personal watercraft, pontoon, and tree wheel due to a different timing of shipment this year compared to last. As you may remember, supply chain issue last year forced us to ship late in these product categories. It resulted in stronger than usual revenue and stronger retail in the third quarter of fiscal year 23, impacting the year-over-year compatibility. Excluding these affected categories, our retail sales were up 21% compared to an industry that was up mid-single digit. Our performance at retail continued to be strong in Latin America with a 30% growth. Demand was softer in Asia Pacific and EMEA, but we still outperformed the market in the latter. Also, we are expecting very low shipment in the short term in the Middle East countries affected by the conflict. Turning to slide six, we see that we have continued to gain share since the beginning of the year in the North American power sport market. Since fiscal year 16, we have gained 17 points of market share to reach approximately 37%. More than one out of three products sold at retail is a BRP product. We have outperformed the industry in ORV, snowmobile, and personal watercraft, which shows the strength and the diversity of our product portfolio. Moving to slide seven. 
At the beginning of the quarter in August and September, year-over-year -year growth remained positive in line with the trend observed in recent quarters. However, since October, we have started to see incremental signs that the macroeconomic and geopolitical environment is affecting the industry. As you can see, if we zoom in on the ORV market, demand began to soften in all regions with more important decline in EMEA and Asia Pacific. This trend is continuing into November. Reflecting this situation and considering the macroeconomic environment, we are proactively adjusting our wholesale shipment plans for the coming quarters. This scenario is reflected in the updated guidance that Sebastian will discuss in a moment. Now let's turn to slide eight for a year-round product. Revenue were down 8% to $1.2 billion. The decline was primarily driven by the different timing of shipment of three-wheel vehicle compared to last year and the temporary border slowdown, which impacted ORV shipments. At retail, Canam side-by-side -side had another very strong quarter with retail up low 10% notably driven by solid market share gain in the utility segment. All industry growth came from the premium vehicle category. This market dynamic is very favorable for Canam given our significant market share in higher hand models. As for ATV, our retail was up mid single digit, led by strong growth in the mid CC segment driven by the success of our newly introduced Outlander platform. We are pleased with the momentum of our off-road business. The strength of our lineup put us in a good position to continue outperforming the industry. Looking at three-wheel vehicle, we ended season 23 with retail down low single digit compared to an industry that was up low single digit. The slight decline came from the Riker. While consumer interest remained high, entry-level buyers have been more resilient lately. Hesitant lately, sorry. Meanwhile, the Spider F3 and RT higher hand model have experienced positive momentum throughout the year. Turning to slide to seasonal product on slide nine. Revenue were down 15% to $869 million, primarily due to the exceptional high level of shipment last year and previously, as previously explained. Looking at our retail performance, we are very pleased with the success of our CEDU product lines. We completed season 23 in North America with an outstanding performance for CEDU, leading to an all-time high market share. Furthermore, we ended the season with the number one market position in all the segments in which we compete and the number one position in all province and state. As for Sidu Pontoon, retail was up over 200% for the season. We ended with the number three market position in the US, but very close to the first two players. In Canada, we estimate that we finished the season with a solid mid 20% market share. Turning to snowmobile, while still relatively early, we are off to a very good start with our strongest season to date retail in the last 10 years. Looking ahead, retail trends for snowmobile are positive and we are well positioned with a strong level of pre-sold units. Moving to slide 10, with power sport, parts, accessories, and apparel and OEM engines. Revenue were up 6% to $315 million, notably driven by higher sales of aircraft engine and pinion gearbox. We also continue to benefit from a growing product portfolio and a larger vehicle fleet in use, which led to higher sales of replacement parts and accessories driven by the Link ecosystem. We are notably seeing solid trend for the new Mavic R, with buyer adding many accessories to their 
This trend demonstrates the benefit of developing highly integrated accessories, which are available right at the launch of the vehicle. Moving to Marine on slide 11. Revenue were down 6% to $104 million due to a lower volume of boat shipment. In general, dealers have high inventory and with higher financing costs, they remain cautious about accepting deliveries during the off-season. Looking at retail sales, from an industry perspective, we continue to see the category being more impacted by higher, end, higher, end, higher interest rates. For Q3, many to retail was down low 20% and Alumacraft down mid 30%. As for Quintrex, although it's still early in the season in Australia, retail was up low single digit. I am proud that our new Quintrex boat the Freestyler X won a good design award in Australia. This prize illustrates the strong appeal and excellence of our new boat design and technology. This is the main reason why we remain confident about the potential of our marine business for the coming years despite current industry challenges. With that, I turn the call over to Sebastian. Thank you, Jose, and good morning, everyone. While our top line performance for the quarter fell short of our expectations due to lower deliveries resulting from an unforeseen slowdown at the, Mex at the Texas Mexico border, our continued focus on efficiency and cost management helped us generate solid margins, which, coupled with a federal tax rate, allow us to deliver a normalized DPS, roughly aligned with our projections. Looking at the numbers, we reported revenues of $2.5 billion, a decrease of 9% compared to last year, primarily due to the different timing of shipments and slower deliveries of ORV products, as previously discussed. We generated $627 million of gross profit, representing a margin of 25.4, up 120 basis points from last year, primarily driven by a positive pricing impact net of cost inflation, lower turbulent costs, a favorable product mix. These benefits were probably offset by less efficient use of our assets due to lower volume than expected, marine business inefficiencies, higher sales program, and unfavorable foreign exchange rate variations in the quarter, which impacted margins by 120 basis points. Moving further down the PL, we generated normalized dividend for the quarter of $445 million, representing a strong margin of 18%. And our normalized net income reached $238 million, resulting in a normalized earnings per share of $3.06. Looking at the cash flow, we generated $695 million of free cash flow so far this year, of which we returned $409 million to our shareholders, through dividends and by completing our NCIB, <coughs> repurchasing a total of 3.5 million shares. Moving to an overview of our network inventory on slide 14. Our network inventory re remains balanced at the end of the third quarter, only up 24% versus pre-COVID level, while our retail is up 43% over the same period. Still, despite improved days of inventory in the network, we are cognizant of the mounting pressure that our dealers face, particularly due to high inventory values and increasing floor plan financing costs. In this context, and in response to recent industry trends and the mounting macroeconomic pressures affecting our consumer behaviors, we have decided to proactively adjust our production schedules. This decision is aimed at ensuring our dealers' inventory remains aligned with prevailing market conditions in order to protect our dealers' value proposition and make sure that our mutual success is sustained. Turning to slide 15 for an update on our guidance. As we look at the fourth quarter, we expect to continue outperforming the industry, especially as we accelerate shipments of the new Maverick R Sport side-by-side -side and the new ATV Outlander mid-CC platform, as we sustain our momentum in utility side-by-side, -side, and as we progress through the snowmobile season, which is already off to a good start. However, Given the aforementioned challenging industry and macroeconomic backdrop, we have adjusted our shipment plan for the remainder of the year and are revising our guidance accordingly. For fiscal 24, we now project total company sales to be up 4 to 
From a profitability standpoint, the realignment of our production schedule to this new shipment plan is generating some short-term inefficiencies, which, coupled with higher sales program, we expect will impact margins in the fourth quarter. As a result, we now project normalized EBITDA to be flat to up 2% for the year and normalized EPS to end between 11.10 and 11.35. Note that our results include a headwind of about $1.40 coming from higher depreciation and financing costs over the last year as we continue to invest to generate future growth and we are impacting by higher interest rate levels. As we approach the next few quarters with a more cautious stance, we are committed to staying agile and efficient and to continue diligently managing our expense, all the while continuing to set solid foundations for the long-term future of our business. We strongly believe our organization is well positioned to continue outperforming the industry and emerge from this cycle even stronger. On that, I will turn the call over to Jose. Thank you, Sebastian. <clears throat> I want to take a moment to share the success of the second edition of our Yellow Day. Last year, we chose intimidation as our global cause. On November 17, we rally our employees, dealers, ambassadors, riders, and partners to take a stance against all forms of intimidation. Our entire network embraced the cause and joined in our global movement which make me very proud. In conclusion, with the strength of our lineups, we continue to deliver robust market share gain over the last 12 months. However, like the rest of the industry, we are seeing softer demand in certain regions. Although we anticipate a few challenging quarters, we remain positive. We are known to be agile and we will make the appropriate adjustment as needed. Since we became BRP 20 years ago, we have never shy away from investing in our future to build a resilient organization that is geared up to respond to market fluctuation. I am confident in our long-term strategy. With our commitment to operational excellence and constant investment in innovation, we are managing the business for continuing success. I am proud of our employees and I thank them for their relentless effort. I also acknowledge our dealers for their support. Together, we'll continue to deliver market shaping product and remain the number one OEM in the industry. On that note, I turn the call over to the operator for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Please note that out of consideration for all callers today, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your touchtone phone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledging your request. And if you would like to withdraw from the question queue, simply press star followed by two. And note that if you're using a speakerphone, you will need to lift the handset before pressing any keys. Please go ahead and press star 1 now if you have any questions. And your first question will be from Craig Kennison at Baird. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Um, so I guess I'm not surprised at all that you're seeing a slowdown given the macro environment. I'm just curious what you think happened in October and November that you know wasn't you know, part of the ecosystem in in prior months. It's just surprising to me that maybe it just happened so quickly. Uh, good morning, Craig. Uh, as you know, uh, we're monitoring uh, constantly consumer demand and the macroeconomic environment. And H1 was in line with our projection and it continued in August and September. But October, uh, it, the, decline, the decline happened in almost all markets, but especially international. And the trend is continuing in November, at least with our numbers. Then we believe that dealers have adequate uh, level of inventory. And you survey dealers often, and you know that they have pressure on the higher inventory costs. So considering the macro environment, you know, the European and APAC situation, don't forget there is two conflicts in Ukraine and uh, Middle East. And the dealer challenges and the industry trend, 
Then proactively, we decided to adjust the shipment for the coming quarter. And all of this is in the context of we continue to gain share. We believe we have enough inventory out there in the network to continue our momentum. But we want to be more cautious uh, to make sure that we protect the value proposition. And we are convinced this is the right thing to do for uh, the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Next question will be from Robin Farley at UBS. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you have um, any thoughts about the um, M25 targets that, that you have out there, your longer-term targets, and if you see those as impacted or think that they could still be intact. You had talked last quarter about you know, even if the revenue didn't get there, the EBITDA still could. So just wondering how you're thinking about those. And and then also, I don't I don't know if you quantified in your comments there. You you, you definitely talked about the outlook softening. Would you kind of put a ballpark quantifying your expectations for for retail in North America um, in in Q4 and and into 2024? Kind of what your current expectations are now with the reset. Thanks. Good morning, Robin. Uh, first, on the M25, the initiatives are not changing. Uh, they are the same. Our focus is the same. But obviously, like I just explained, with the recent industry trend in North America and international and the macroeconomic environment, we're now working with more conservative industry numbers uh, going forward. Uh, we want to be, again, responsible and we proactively reduce shipment to improve the inventory return. And we uh, believe that fiscal year 25 revenue could be down uh, next year. And at this point, with the trend we're seeing, uh, we don't expect to achieve the M25 target as planned. Now, again, I would like to remind you that we're well positioned with the inventory we have to continue to gain market share and we, uh, we target to remain the OEM of choice. And on this, I will give the, the, the mic to Sebastien just to give you a, an idea about the numbers. Yeah, good morning, Robin. And, and it is obviously still early, and we still have a few months to go before we firm up the assumptions for the planning for next year. But generally, we are expecting a softer industry. Uh, and, and from a profitability standpoint, heading into next year, uh, obviously, we expect demand for premium products to remain strong. And that obviously is going to help from a mixed perspective. And we do expect our, our marine business to be stronger as well next year as we've had challenges with a ramp up of production and that impacted profitability. However, despite these benefits, uh, we, do, uh, we do expect some offsets, uh, again, with lower volume, less efficient use of assets, probably higher sales programs as well, because we are seeing other OEMs running with higher inventory and also higher promotional environment. And also, again, we've, we invest in the business, so we should expect higher depreciation as well next year. Uh, OPEX will probably run higher as well as a percentage of revenue than we did this year. Uh, we are continuing to invest in growth projects. So all in all, when you combine all of these elements with a softer revenue, uh, we could lose a point or so of EBITDA margin uh, compared to this year. Again, as Jose mentioned, the strength of our lineups, our brand, we are super well positioned and we expect the fundamentals of M25 to continue generating growth for us especially market share gains. Uh, but we believe we are taking the right actions to support our dealer. And also we prefer obviously retailing current products and non-current products. And that's why we are diligent in managing inventory. Great, that's a very helpful color for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Next question will be from James Hardiman at City. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, thanks for taking my call, and, and I think that was um, that was a really good color on sort of next year. Obviously, um, nobody's going to hold you to that. It's it's pretty early, but I, I think you you mentioned a softer industry for next year. Just just to clarify, is that softer than previously expected, or you actually expect the industry uh, to be down next year? And and if so, what does that mean <clears throat> for how you think about your your own? Uh, retail in, in fiscal 25. 
Yeah, well, uh, as I said, there we still got a few months to go before we firm up the assumptions for guidance next year. But given the macroeconomic and political backdrop there, we expect the industry to be down next year. But we'll give you more color when we uh, we talk in Q4 on, uh, on our results and the guidance for next year. Okay, but to clarify, you, you think the industry will be down? Could, do, you, do you think your own retail will be down or do you think? Uh, market share gains will, will be more than enough to offset that. Still early, still early to, to give any color for next year. Uh, we'll obviously monitor how the situation is evolving in the fourth quarter, and that's obviously going to be a big driver as to how we uh, we set up for next year. But we're Got confident. It. And then, we're confident, confident to continue to gain market share. With the strength of our lineup, with the trend, with the, the premium, uh, we're confident to continue our momentum with market share. Makes sense. And then on the inventory front, um, you know, it, it sounds like days on hand are are lower than they were uh, pre-pandemic. Could you maybe quantify what that number was and, and how that compares to, to pre-pandemic? Just trying to get a feel for um, what should we should expect for the end of this year um, and whether or not we should be factoring in any sort of inventory corrections as we look to fiscal 25. The uh, Today, as we mentioned there, when you look at our inventory returns, they're healthier than pre-COVID, but uh, we want to operate with uh, higher inventory returns than pre-COVID and dealers as well want, want that. Uh, the expectation for this year is that inventory at the end of Q4 will probably be flat to up Single digit versus where we are where we are at Q3. Uh, obviously, very dependent on the how the snowmobile season will evolve, but it's off to a good start. Um, next year, some of the wholesale adjustments that we will do uh, will be as a result of uh, managing the inventory in the network. So, if you were to ask me, we said, would you want inventory to be lower at the end of next year than it is today? Uh, it's certainly something that I'd like to see because, as I said, we prefer retailing current products than non-current products. And so given the current backdrop and the softness in the market, running with leaner inventory is beneficial for us because less programs and beneficial for the dealers as well because less discounts. Got it. Um, if, I, if I may ask, um, that was the follow-up, but if, I may ask a follow-up to was the follow-up. Follow the follow -up? <laughs> yeah. Do you think your peers will see the, the current environment in, in much the same way? Um, it seems like there's maybe risk that if you're taking a really conservative approach um, and, and hoping to finish uh, next year with lower levels of inventory, if your peers aren't doing the same, um, then you, you could ultimately, A, lose market share, but B, still feel the effects of a dealer channel um, that feels like it has too much inventory. But I don't know. I don't want to predict what the peers are doing or will do. But one thing I can tell you, pre-COVID, we had less inventory than our competitor, and we've been gaining shares since fiscal year 16. And we're doing this by protecting the value proposition uh, of the dealers. Then we believe we we truly believe in 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 our plan that if we are uh, uh, increasing the inventory return protect the dealer profitability this will uh, pay off long term and this we had it pre covid from fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 21 we're gaining share with less inventory than our peers and we want to make sure that again we're protecting the value proposition our dealers, and that will be um, that will be uh, uh, more successful going forward. Very helpful. Thanks for the color, guys. Thank you. Next question will be from Martin Landry at Stiefel. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Um, I'd like to just get some color on um, the order of magnitude of your of your production costs, uh, your production cuts. Sorry for that you're making in Q4. Can you give us, uh, you know, uh, just an idea of um, how much uh, you've cut your production for Q4? Well, the best way to read it, Martin, is by looking at the adjustment we made in the guidance. So again, with one quarter to go, uh, we've adjusted guidance downward. 
uh, to reflect may, uh, mostly uh, production cuts. And so that's the main driver from a top line point of view. Uh, if you look at, oh, we're expecting a strong quarter for, uh, for uh, year-round products because we're going to catch up from the, uh, we'll the Texas-Mexico situation that happened in the third quarter. So there's probably about 100, or a little over $100 million of revenue coming from that. Uh, but also we have Maverick Cars to ship the new ATV platform that's shipping and high-end uh, side-by-sides as well. So we'll have a, a decent quarter there. And we're, uh, we're delivering the final snowmobiles, which, for which we have pre-orders from dealers and customers as well. So uh, expecting, uh, expecting a, a, a good quarter as well for seasonal products. Okay. And, and just um, trying to understand a little bit, what's your, uh, what's your, your approach to uh, promotional activity? Uh, you know, some OEMs you've mentioned are very promotional. So, so what's your strategy uh, to protect your, your market share on a go forward basis? Do you want to match these promotions? Like, how are you thinking about that? Uh, first, uh, some of our competition right now <clears throat> are having promotion on model year 23 and 24. We have no promotion on 24, uh, and but obviously, like normal, uh, we have promotion on 23. Then we're trying to be balanced, uh, obviously, again, to protect uh, our brands and our value proposition uh, and to continue our momentum. But it's, it's a fine line. But at this point, uh, we have more promotion, obviously, than last year. But we are still, we believe, uh, in a normal path uh, like uh, we had pre-COVID. Okay. Okay. Thank you, and best of luck. Thank you. Next question will be from Joe Altabello at Raymond James. Thanks. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, I guess first question, was hoping to get a little bit more clarity on the software demand um, and the adjustments in production. It sounds like it's mostly off-road and mostly marine, um, but am I, is, it, is it really more across the board, or is it, is it primarily in those two categories? That's correct. Uh, Off-road uh, and marine is where we've adjusted. Uh, we've also adjusted PNA because same same story for PNA versus units. We want to be diligent in managing the inventory the, in the network as well. Uh, and so we've made adjustments to the PNA shipment plan uh, based on uh, the current inventory in the network. We do have a bit of visibility there. Uh, and also uh, expectations on on retail in the fourth quarter as well. Okay, and just to follow up on that, um, it looks like based on your your revised guidance, you're expecting double digit growth for year round products in Q4, and obviously a lot of that's the catch up that you talked about earlier from the uh, slowdown at, at the at the border. But it also looks like your marine revenue guidance implies double digit growth in Q4. So help us understand uh, that dynamic, given that demand is so soft in that category. Yeah, we're lapping a very easy quarter last year in Q4 for Marine. We were in the in the beginning of the ramp up of uh, the new many two boats. Uh, and as you know, it was a challenging uh, ramp up. And so last year we had very little shipments on the Marine side. And so this year, uh, now that the production is running much more smoothly, uh, we are expecting to deliver uh, the, new, the new product to the market. Ahead of okay. Bocho, and obviously dealers need these units for Bocho. And, and just one one last one, if I could, the renewal of the NCIB, um, the timing of that is that impacted at all by the fact that the Canadian tax on buybacks goes into effect January first, or is that not in your thinking? Well, obviously we uh, we don't like the tax there. We don't think that uh, we think that the government missed the mark in putting this tax in play. But it's not impacting our decision whether or not to do buybacks. Uh, it's a two percent tax that they're putting in place. Uh, if you look at what we've done in terms of investments over the last five years, and that tax is meant to uh, stimulate companies to do investments in the business. But uh, if you see the amount of capex we've done, the R and D we've done over the last five years. Uh, it's not because we've done buybacks that it has held us back. And so, no, uh, not related to anything on timing. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next question 
will be from Benoit Poirier at Desjardins Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Just, just to come back on the promotional activities, could, could you mention maybe quantify uh, more color about the impact in the quarter and whether next year uh, you're going to be trending in line with pre-pandemic level or uh, above in order to, uh, to, to maintain a dealer inventory at a good level? Good morning, Benoit. Uh, for the quarter, the, prefer, the promotional environment was a headwind of 100, and, 100 basis points in the quarter versus last year. You might recall that when we issued guidance, we said we expect promotional environment to be a headwind of uh, 200 basis points. We got a positive tailwind of 300 during COVID. So we, the expectation is that we would keep 100 basis points this year. Year to date, we're running at 190 basis points, so we're still within our uh, our expectations or our assumptions. And I expect the end of the year will probably end at that 200 basis point. For next year, again, given that we are diligent in managing inventory, I think that's going to help us in being less promotional uh, and making sure that we focused on dealer profitability. And as you know, dealers are making more money selling our products, and I, we think that is what's going to be driving our retail performance more than discounting. Uh, non-current units. Okay, perfect. And just in terms of capital deployment, um, you end up uh, the quarter with a leverage of 1.4. I would be curious to get uh, more color about uh, whether you still expect uh, some uh, working capital reversal in Q4 and how the, does the uh, market softening impact uh, capital deployment uh, with respect to a uh, potential SIB, uh, some product launches, or uh, any um, opportunity maybe to to look more closely at m uh, over the next 12 or 24 months, given the, the softening market environment? Hey, uh, that's a, that's a lot. There's a few follow-ins on that question, but uh, obviously, given the, the production cuts we've done, uh, it is going to impact the tailwind that we were expecting from working gap that we were expecting 400 million. So we'll probably be short of that, but still we're expecting a tailwind in the fourth quarter. Uh, we'll be generating over a billion dollars of free cash flow this year. And so some of that went through the NCIB. We, as you saw, we just reinitiated our NCIB. And so we'll be opportunistic on that area as well. Uh, and as we said, our priority is to continue to invest in the business with OPEX, uh, with CapEx, sorry, uh, because we're, we, we're, we're obviously very focused on growing this business and we've been successful doing so and we'll continue uh, focusing on that. And as for the M&A, uh, again, if we'll, we've, we've always been opportunistic. If it happens, we'll, uh, we'll obviously consider it if it's strategic to our business. Certainly something that we look at but we're not necessarily uh, in the in the market looking for M&A actively today. Perfect. That's very colored. Thanks. Thank you. Next question will be from Jean Chiu at BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for the question. Maybe um, given this kind of softer demand, can you talk about the cost base and how you can kind of, you know, maybe places where you can kind of cut, cut the cost to kind of protect the margins? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it always varies the, on, on how soft the market is. Uh, first thing, we want to be strategic on what we look at when we, when we address costs. Uh, we want to be flexible as well. Uh, but we want to protect the business for the long term. Uh, and so the last thing we want is cut profusely in, in activities such as R&D and key marketing activities that uh, will hurt the business on the long term. But we want to be tactical as well and address short-term headwinds that we might see in the business. So there is uh, there is room to uh, adjust our cost structure in the short term, uh, yet plan for the long term as well. Okay, got it. And then I think you kind of talked about expectation a little bit for industry retail going into next year. But maybe can you think about um, the different geographies? Obviously, international softer uh, in October. Does that kind of trend where North America is kind of outperforming international continue into next year, you think? Or? Well, if you look to our result in Q1, Q2, and Q3, I mean, we saw some weakness uh, since the beginning of the year in EMEA and APAC. It's a it's market that fluctuated a lot. 
uh, in the last uh, three quarters. Now, uh, obviously, uh, at, the end, at the tail end of Q3, it was uh, worse than what we were expecting. Uh, United States is still okay, but there is some, you know, uh, uh, key economic data that we're following that uh, we need to be cautious. The unemployment rate is still low at 3.9%. The inflation, and that's U.S. at the end of October, uh, the inflation is going down 3.2 at the end of October, the closer to the target of 2. Consumer confidence decline uh, in July, uh, it, since July, from 71 to 61, and the credit card balance is record high. Then there is a sign that the U.S. is also softening, and this combined to the, the international market, particularly EMEA and APAC, and again, the two conflict uh, in the world, uh, that's why we prefer to be prudent. Okay, very helpful. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Thank you. Next question will be from Jonathan Goldman at Scotia Bank. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Um, on the retail trend, I was wondering if you can discuss the cadence of retail, how it's trended in November. Did you see the pace of declines accelerate versus October or show any moderation or any color on the cadence would be helpful? Well, on the, we, we don't have industry numbers yet for November, but uh, our retail is, uh, is still up, uh, but we expect the industry to be down in November. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then second on the competitive dynamics, the presentation calls out elevated discounting by competitors on new model year units. Do you have a sense if that's largely the reflection of the worsening industry or weaker consumer, or maybe it's something specific to a competitor strategy, maybe a share gain approach? I think, I think uh, in, in some industry, uh, we're gaining significant market share, and some competitor uh, want to defend their, their position. And this is why, particularly in RV, uh, discount uh, what surprised us is discount on model year 23, but model year 24 product. Uh, at this time of the year, it's quite aggressive. But it's to defend their market share position. Okay, thank you, guys. I appreciate the color. Thank you. Next question will be from Janae Katz at Morningstar. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. I hope you can um, maybe elaborate on an earlier um, question about the marine business, because if um, revenues are turning positive again, then can we assume profitability, at least that the gross profit line has hit a trough? And if so, could it potentially turn positive again in the fourth quarter? Well, uh, Marine had a, another tough quarter in Q3. Uh, obviously, the longer ramp up of boats and very little shipments because dealer inventory. Uh, that's the number one reason. The weaker industry is obviously not helping. And this quarter, we also had a special charge coming from the legacy Evan Rule business uh, where we uh, had a special charge on inventory and that impacted profitability significantly. And so our plan is obviously for the turnaround to happen. Uh, some of it we'll see in the fourth quarter, but the expectation is that next year we'll see a much improved profitability on the marine front. Okay. And then from a pricing perspective, um, I think there's probably some sentiment that it will be harder to raise prices um, next year, um, in which case, um, could there be some pressure on gross margin? And if so, um, what levers do you guys have or plan to use to mitigate those headwinds? Thank you. Well, obviously, pricing is top of mind, especially in this higher inflationary environment. And inflation on on cost on salaries is still there, so we'll be uh, we'll be diligent in making sure that we price uh, price our products in line with the cost structure that we have. But one of the huge benefits we have is our obviously our, our manufacturing footprint. That is, uh, the majority of what we produce is in Mexico. And so obviously we have a, a better cost advantage there coming out of the uh, production facilities we have. And also in our approach to designing our products through modularity and what we've just recently launched, a new ATV platform 
is under this new design approach. And so the majority of our lineup uh, is on on uh, on this modular design. And so that's obviously helping us drive better margins, uh, I believe, versus the competition. And so it's giving us a, a hefty competitive advantage. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Next question will be from Luke Hannon at Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Josie, I think you, you mentioned earlier that uh, for three-wheel vehicles, it was entry-level sales that were uh, a little bit softer. Is that consistent with what you saw for your other product lines as well? And then maybe just following up on that, how have you been able to, can you maybe uh, describe the share capture that you've been able to do within the entry-level portion of your, your broader product lines versus premium, uh, given that there's been a bit of a washout of those lower-end uh, OEMs in the market? Thanks. Yeah, if I give you some some data that we follow on the value versus premium trend, and and we, obviously it's dif- depending different from one product category to the other, but on the side by side in Q3, and this is the industry, uh, the value product were down about mid uh, double digit, when the premium was up uh, about 20 percent, and this is definitely uh, helping us, and. Our numbers for the three-wheel vehicle, because we closed the, the season 23 uh, in, in Q3, the Riker category, which we consider value with our three-wheel lineup, was down about 20%, but the F3 and the RT, the high-end model, were up 20%. Then the trend that we saw since the beginning of the year where there is more traction on the premium and uh consumer uh, that uh, uh, have lower household income uh, are more hesitant to to finance the product uh, is affecting the value, then this is continuing. That being said, overall, if you step back and you look at the big picture, we want to win in each category, but we're more skewed to premium product. And I think this is one of the reasons why we're continuing to gain share in this uh, tougher environment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question will be from Cameron Dirksen at National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe just a bigger picture question um, around sort of the, the, the competitive environment. Um, you know, I know in the past uh, you, you've made some commentary about, you know, in a, in a potential downturn scenario, there might be an expectation that some of the smaller players in power sports might choose to exit the industry. We've actually you know, seen some exits, even in a, in a good environment. So I'm just wondering how what your thoughts around, you know, if we have kind of a protracted downturn in the industry, call it a, you know, a year or so, you know, what do you think will happen with some of the, the marginal competitors? I mean, do you, do you think you'd still want to see a, a still potentially would we see a trend where, you know, these, these companies would be investing less in, the, in power sports? I mean, this is very difficult to to predict uh, what our competitor will do. Uh, but if we're focusing on our things and uh, and the dealers, uh, the dealer right now with the the, the slowdown in the industry, uh, some dealer have at least they have option to decide. And we believe that with the space that uh, now our business is requiring, these the space in the service shop, uh, that some dealer could be uh, uh, would make the decision to drop some product line. And this is, uh, we saying, we saying from time to time, and this could happen in this downturn, then I don't want to comment on what the competition could do, but I think there will, there will be some dealer who will have to make some call on do they keep everything or do they drop some smaller line for them. Okay, no, that, 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 that makes sense. And, and just as a kind of a follow-up and sort of related is just thinking about, your, your capex as we look ahead to next year. Obviously, you're not in a position to uh, to guide at this point, but um, you know, uh, you know, part of your your market share gains here have been you know continuing to invest in, in new product. I mean, it's just directionally, what do you what do you think capex might do in, in fiscal 2025? I mean, do you think you'll still obviously continue to to invest significantly in the product line, or will we see an easing off of that? We should see a continued investments in capex, or uh, a number similar to what we have this year, is something that would be reasonable to model. Okay. Very good. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next question will be from Mark Petrie at CIBC. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks, uh, and thanks for all the comments thus far. Very helpful. Just a couple follow-ups, I guess, specific to the fiscal 24 guidance. Um, you know, implies about 100 basis points lower EBITDA margins for the year versus what you had previously provided. So, Seb, I think you said programs are in line with expectations. So, is the lower run rate just just simply lost leverage on the slower volumes, or are there is there another factor? The majority of it low, uh, lower leverage from manufacturing side, given the sh- we'll call it the short term uh, production cut that we did. Uh, so less time to rebalance our production and, and be more efficient. And the other one is uh, OPEX as a percentage of revenue will be slightly higher because of the cuts in production. And yeah, understood. Yeah, okay, perfect. And then also just following up on uh, the comments you shared with regards to sort of the demographics of the customer and um, and sensitivity there. Can you just update us in terms of what you're seeing um, from the customer uh, that's that's active in the business today? You know, who's new new to the industry, returning returning to BRP, uh, and any sort of color you can provide on demographics that would be helpful. We didn't see any trend change uh, into the industry, and uh, and this is we don't have data on this, but uh, we're hearing from dealers that there's more. Um, for the, the customer with lower income, there is more uh, credit reject uh, approval, but we don't have any hard facts on this. Uh, it's more an anecdote that we're hearing from dealers. But except that, uh, Mark, we don't see uh, any change. Any change. Obviously, the household income is still higher than it was pre-COVID. The new entrant, uh, same ballpark. But it's more the entry, the lower household income customer who has more difficulty to finance their product with the high interest rate. And I think the bank are more restrictive than they used to be. Yeah, understood. Okay, thanks for the comments and all the best. Thank you. Next question will be from Tristan Thomas Martin at BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, of your your kind of your uh, fiscal 24 guidance for revenue. How much of that is selling? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. I mean, how much of that is either incremental new product launches or channel fill? Well, the, uh, as I said, the inventory, the plan for inventory in Q4 uh, versus Q3 was be, would be to flat to uh, up single digit. The channel fill is going to happen more with the new products that we launched in side-by-side and the high-end side-by-side. So the, the Maverick R is obviously something that will be channel fill. Uh, the new ATV platform as well is where we're going to be seeing, uh, we're going to be seeing uh, more deliveries uh, and off from obviously there is some replenishment that's happening on the ORV side, but that's the main driver of uh, Q4 wholesale. Okay. Um, and then I just want to follow up to, I believe it was James' follow up of a follow up. Um, if just kind of like the, your playbook, if let's say the industry gets a little bit softer than you think or the competitors get more aggressive, is it fair to assume that you would rather slow shipments than continue to ship and then have to subsequently promote? Yeah, you know, uh, I would like to remind, to remind that uh, we've been we've been through those cycle many many times, and and I've personally been through a few of those over my 30 years at BRP. And and one thing we've learned over time is when you see these situations develop, you're always better to be proactive. And uh, we've been we've been gaining share uh, since fiscal year 16. We have developed an incredible value proposition for the dealers, and we want to protect that. And this is what we're doing. We just proactively, uh, we're just proactively reacting to a softer demand to make sure that we protect that, and we convince this is the right thing to do for the long term. Okay, right. thank you. Sure. Next question will be from Shabat Khan at RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, great. Thanks and good morning. I'm just following up on kind of the dealer inventory question from just earlier. I guess you said you wanted inventories to ideally be lower kind of by the end of next year. I guess can you maybe shed a little bit of color on is that really if demand plays out according to your expectations? You know, what are dealers telling you in terms of their plans for fiscal 25 in terms of, you know, do you have a magnitude on how much lower they would like inventories to be given the 
floor plan financing costs? And maybe just kind of the follow up is, are there any incentives or um, ways you're looking to help them with the floor plan financing cost if the current rate environment continues? Yeah, first of all, the situation is not is not bad in the network. And we're in better shape than pre-COVID, as we talked earlier in the prepared remarks. Inventory is up 24%, yet our retail is up 43%. Uh, however, dealers have seen price increases, MSRPs have gone up, and so the value of the inventory is higher. The mix as well is more richer, so we sell more high-end models from in all product categories. And the uh, Product mix as well is different. There's a lot more side-by-sides with higher MSRPs, more switch as well. And so despite the, 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 the dollars increasing by 24%, the value is up 50%. And so when you factor in as well a, a, a financing cost that is probably high, increased by 300 basis points for the dealer, they're seeing the impact of a monthly floor plan cost. <laughs> And so uh, that's why we want to be diligent in managing the inventory, especially in the current economic context. Uh, We do support our dealers with a free floor plan period, uh, and we do support dealers as well when we come out of a season uh, and there's more inventory. And so we've been active in the past to do this, and we will continue going forward. Uh, And so we're we want to we want to make sure that we manage that inventory. So there might be a reduction of inventory, and in, let's say in the low teen percentage for next year, that would be a nice number to achieve. Uh, but again, the situation today is is not a disaster. It's it's very much uh, very healthy when you compare it to pre COVID. Great, thanks very much. Thank you. Next question will be from Brian Morrison at TD Securities. Please go ahead. Thank you. Many of my questions are asked, but I want to ask about what you're seeing in terms of price in the used market. I think the question was posed earlier. I didn't understand the answer. There's obviously been some softening this year, but are you seeing acceleration in October and November? And if so, what do you see of the magnitude of your year decline in used prices? Yeah, we do have a bit of visibility on the used market, but the used market is still healthier than pre-COVID. Uh, the gap of new to use has increased. Uh, I mean, it was almost zero during COVID. Now it has increased. Uh, but someone looking in to trade in a used product will get a good value because MSRPs have gone up quite a bit in the last uh, two to three years. So, and plus there hasn't been, there, there's been a, a shortening of supply in the last two three years. So there's not actually a big used market. Uh, contrary to what uh, people might uh, might expect. And so it's still very healthy, uh, Brian. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. And at this time, Monsieur Deschain, we have no other questions. Please proceed. Thank you, Sylvie. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning and for your interest in BRP. We look forward to speaking with you again in March for our fourth quarter conference call. Thanks again, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this does indeed conclude your conference call for today. Once again, thank you for attending, and at this time, we do ask that you please disconnect your lines.